How did you get the idea for Silver Spitfire, the longest flight? Well, we set up a flying academy 10 years ago and our aim was always to inspire with that academy. Uh, we do that now through training people to fly the aeroplane and by taking nearly 600 people a year up for, for pleasure trips uh, to give them the sense of what this aeroplane is about. As a result of that business, uh, we were given the opportunity to buy this very, very special uh, airframe, one that hadn't been touched because it had been a museum for so many years, and one that had incredible wartime history. And uh, so we, we, we bought it, uh, knowing that we wanted to restore it, but then wanted to inspire with it in the way we had with the other aircraft we had in the academy and thought, well, why don't we do so? Why don't we take this aeroplane back to so many of those other countries where it fought on behalf of, of them and their freedom, um, places that won't have seen it for many, many years, many decades. Let's take it around the world, uh, do something that's never been done before, challenge ourselves, inspire ourselves, and also inspire everyone um, that we get to meet, hopefully, or at least some, uh, and, uh, and, and at the very least, take it back uh, so people can hear that engine and see the, see the sight of those elliptical wings flying over their heads um, at a time of peace. So we've had a bit of time to, to reflect on the, uh, the achievement. I, um, I'm enormously proud to have had any part in uh, flying a Spitfire. To have done something in a Spitfire that no one else has ever done, to have inspired people around the world and to have brought that aeroplane back successfully uh, and to have ensured that you know the team came home safely with it, uh, I'm enormously proud of too. Uh, I've been very lucky to have some very, very amazing moments in my flying career, but um, I don't think any of them will uh, will top this achievement. Um, it was hard. It was it was hard from the moment we said we were going to do it until uh, we uh, we got back, and actually it took us a while to to get over it. It's a strange feeling when you spend two and a half years aiming for this moment where you're going to be home and the whole thing's going to be complete. And when it finally happens, it's like, well, what do I aim for tomorrow? And, and that took a while to get used to, but now relaxed into it, now back home. And now I sort of look at the photos and the videos. We hope a documentary coming out soon, seeing the rushes for that. And it just refreshes our memory on, uh, on how it felt at the time, the spectacular views we saw, the wonderful people we met, um, and the achievement that we made and um, yeah I'm, I, I kind of grow more proud uh, by the day of it as I, as I realise uh, exactly what we've done. The most difficult challenge on the way it was uh, certainly the weather. We were flying this aeroplane um, in visual rules only so unlike a modern airliner we can fly in clouds, fly the whole trip in cloud, come down and approach in clouds, see the runway at the last minute land. We had to be able to see the ground the entire time we were flying, or at least see, be able to see parts of it and be in clear air where we could see a long way ahead. Um, we were travelling, you know, between 400 and 600 miles on each leg. If you think the UK is four or 500 miles from top to toe, and the amount of different weather systems you see in that, uh, in that um, distance, it gives you a sense of... Uh, what doing that around the world might be like. Additional to that, if you're flying in Europe, there's all sorts of apps and weather information that you can use to build a mental picture of what the weather's doing and to make decisions based on that. And uh, for at least a third of the entire trip, we didn't have anything like that. No idea what was going on. It was just a case of looking at very rudimentary weather charts and trying to work out what sort of weather would be associated with those systems. And we didn't get it right every time. You know, we, we were right from the outset, we said we won't take any risks, but it's amazing when you have this momentum behind you and wanting to go and get to the next point, how the, the, um, the margins can become reduced and compressed a little bit. 
for the most part it was very safe um, but we made a few errors as I said and um, uh, yeah one day in particular we had to turn back immediately after takeoff on, on leaving a Caliwet in uh, north eastern Canada uh, we thought we had a gap to get out it closed in pretty much as soon as we were um, airborne and we were back on the ground within five minutes but in those five minutes we've been pushed very very close to the sea and to some uh, some hills and mountains that were, were near the airfield itself so uh, we resolved that day not to be pushed into that position again uh, and pretty much uh, we weren't so weather around the world was a big challenge. Most of the other challenge we faced while we were flying, um, uh, while we were away, we'd, we'd hopefully solve before we left, such as the right kind of fuel. That you know, it's very difficult to get avgas for the Spitfire in many of the countries we went to, but that was all sorted months before we left. So, and we were lucky uh, that pretty much everywhere we went, the fuel was there when we got there. The worst. We had was a wait of, uh, of just one day um, for fuel to arrive, which in the grand scheme of things was was superb. So yeah, whether I mean any to any pilots out there that uh, think about doing anything like this, first of all, incredible. I mean, what a way to see the world. But I would uh, think very carefully before before doing it uh, VFR or using visual rules. You need to have some instrument capability. Well, there are moments when. Uh, I thought we wouldn't make it. I think we took each leg of the trip at a time. You know, we didn't think about the, the, the or we tried not to think about the great goal of getting the aeroplane back because uh, that would put too much pressure. We just wanted to make the right decisions for the day that we were going. So to say um, I thought we'd never make it, I guess we weren't really considering that. We were just trying to see every day how far we could get. However, there was one occasion um, when in the aircraft itself in Russia, when we hadn't made the, a brilliant weather call, it, was, it turned out to be the right call, but at the time we were worried. Um, I have never felt so lonely in my life. Um, we were stuck between two cloud layers, mountain poking up for mountains, a range of mountains poking up between the, the, the level, uh, the cloud layer below us. Uh, which tells me as a pilot, bear in mind flying an aeroplane with an 80 year old engine in the front that could stop at any moment, that either a forced landing uh, or jumping out and parachuting into that terrain would be pretty unfriendly. Uh, so that really got my attention. As we progressed, these two cloud layers came closer and closer together to a point where they actually joined and meant we could no longer go any further on that track. And we tried, you know, going off to the right and to the left and eventually we had to turn around go back we didn't know whether we could go back to our our departure airfield uh, because we thought the weather was was closing in there we had no way of getting hold of them um, so we couldn't really use that as an option we had no other alternates uh, in that part of Russia so we had to push on towards Magadan our final destination uh, and a flight that took an hour and 10 minutes or so, or was supposed to take an hour and 10 minutes, actually took an hour and 45 minutes. And, uh, and in that time, uh, I have to say, uh, I, I wished, uh, it was the only time on the whole trip actually, where most of the time I sat in the cockpit thinking, I'm just the luckiest person in the world to be here, to be doing this. But it's the one time I sat there and thought, I wish I was anywhere else in the world now than sat here because it felt lonely and because we were running out of options and we were running out of ideas and uh, and and that's not a great feeling in an airplane where you have to keep forward motion you have to just keep going but it worked out and um, uh, by one of the mountains we saw a clearing in the lee side both airplanes able to dive through and, and come out underneath and uh, and once we were underneath, we could see the final 25 miles to uh, to the airfield we were landing at. And never has a beer tasted better than it did that night in Magadan. So what has this mission taught me about this planet? It's taught me that the planet, our Earth, is vast, absolutely huge. 
um, you know, we flew over or very close to some significantly built up areas um, in the world, uh, in, in India, in the US, in Canada, um, and in Europe, of course. But what really amazed me was the huge swathes of the planet where there were just no people at all. And in some places, not even a sign. So the longest trip we did, the longest flight, was from uh, Kuwait to Jordan. There was one road that, flew, that, that followed us pretty much the whole way along our, our trip on the, um, on the Saudi-Iraq border. But otherwise, virtually no sign of habitation. In Russia, uh, we'd fly five, six hundred miles an hour from one place with 500 people to another place with a thousand people and there would be nothing in between. No scars on the land, no, no sign of anything touched by humans. Um, so it really made me think about all the news we get about, you know, how overpopulated the planet is. And that's because as humans, we tend to want to live together. Um, but there is a lot of space out there still. Uh, it's incredibly important that we continue uh, to manage the effect that we have on the planet, but there is a lot of space left uh, uh, still out there. I have no doubt uh, that in certain places, had I force landed or, uh, or had to jump out under parachute, but for the fact that I had a GPS uh, locator on me, there is every chance I've never been found. It is huge, absolutely huge. I also, it also made me realise how, and I hope I knew this already, but the world is full of really nice people. Everywhere we went, we were treated so well. Uh, that's always been my experience with, with flying. It's very, 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 very irregular or infrequent that someone creates a problem for you. And it just reinforced the fact that the world is full of really good people, nice people trying to live a good life, look after their families, and just be happy. And, uh, and we saw an enormous amount of that. And, uh, and that was wonderful. What has this mission taught me about myself? It's given me confidence, I think, um, that faced with a challenge, faced with the right people around me, um, I can conquer that challenge. It's down to effort, certainly. In most cases, an enormous amount of. Um, and just trying to think around problems and trying to work with people to create uh, solutions. Uh, you know, flying an aeroplane that is uh, 80 years old, that is certified in a completely different way than most aeroplanes flying around the world, and in a way that almost every other aviation authority doesn't understand caused a huge problem for us and something that we spent a lot of time dealing with each country over to give them confidence that it was safe enough to bring this aeroplane into, into their airspace. Um, there were an enormous number of challenges, as you can imagine. Um, but from a personal point of view, I'm really happy that we overcame them. We overcame them safely and that we brought the entire team home uh, and the aircraft home all in one piece for other people to enjoy. Are there life learnings you can take away from this adventure? There are life learnings I can take away from this adventure and the biggest one for me um, was, a, was a real shock. I was in the middle of Russia, on the eastern coast of Russia. Um, and my girlfriend was expecting our first child. And I got a very, very uh, emotional call from her saying that there was a significant problem um, with, uh, with the baby and that she was on her way to hospital. And I have never felt so lonely in my life. Uh, and I made it home in 36 hours. Uh...